we're coming to an even darker part. And I can tell you that this whole, um, this whole research um, was um, taking a toll on me some months ago, and it was actually a heart doing that. And um, you must remember, this is a, a reportage we're doing together, so we're exploring things. And what happened mm -hmm. around uh, March 15th, when I was still doing my research, I got a call from, the, from a friend, and um, it's a couple, and they're doing research on networks of hatred in, uh, in the online world, and I get a call that um, there was a terrible massacre happening um, in Christchurch, New Zealand. So at the time when I was looking at Extinction Rebellion and uh, wondering um, where this is all going and what this will tell me, um, at looking at people who, this for example is one of their actions, Our Blood, Bern Bundesplatz. Friday 15th was one of the climate strikes days and um, this is one of the Extinction Rebellion actions. It's a die-in. This happened. So, um, Prent and Tarrant went to two mosques in the peaceful town of Christchurch, New Zealand, and he um, committed a heinous act of murder and killed 51 people in total, and he released a manifesto. And so, the couple had convinced me to look at that manifesto. It took me some weeks to actually do it because I saw no connection at all to the gentle people at Extinction Rebellion that I had met. And I was struck by something. So if you look at the cover of this thing, it says the great replacement. And um, the first thing in this wheel of supposedly these are the values, like the core values of, the, of Brent and Tarrant. The first thing you see on the upper right, where one o'clock is, is environmentalism. And I was struck. How could a white supremacist be related to environmentalism, after all? And so I started to like look at the details, like the codes in this, uh, I think, 50-page manifesto. And the first thing is the title. The Great Replacement refers to Le Grand Remplacement, so, um, Renaud Camus is a um, French, very well-known uh, landscape painter um, who has become a driving force for the um, French right-wing, ultra-right-wing, uh, racist and neo-fascist movement, and also an inspirational force for um, the identitarian movement. And in his manifesto, Brenton Tarrant mentions that um, his final moment of understanding what this is all about happened in France. So he was really in, literally in France. And um, so I was wondering, could Renaud Camus by all means be somehow related to um, anything environmentalist and ecological at all? And I was starting to investigate Renaud Camus. In the 1970s, this guy used to hang out with Andy Warhol and Cy Twombly. He was an artist. He um, he wrote a really well-known um, book, Tricks, um, about his like, sexual adventures, and um, was very much of a, apparently like a liberal person. But then um, in, um, he, he must have changed his mind in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's very little known that he actually set up a party. Because he had become a landscape painter, he lives on a castle in the French province, and um, he was getting annoyed by the change of the environment that he was painting. So he thought it was being replaced, the beauty of nature was being replaced by um, men and cities and streets. And so he set up in a party called Innocence. You can still find the website, which says on its website, we're an ecological party. So it's a green party, this guy actually Found it, and the Great Replacement is about like um, the generally the idea of white genocide, white people being replaced by people coming into the white territory or so. And it's a weird book, and so I reached out to uh, Renaud Camus, and I asked him, "So you set up this ecological party, environmental party back then? Um, what do you think about climate change? Is this a thing for you?" 
And so he answered um, that climate change will be one of the most important reasons for the Great Replacement because it will give a justification for the Davis elites to replace the white people with climate refugees. And um, he said, climate change, I'm asking him, what impact will climate change ha have um, on geopolitics? And he said, enormous and colossal. Um, and so um, I, I, was, I, was literally, I was literally struck. So the identitarian movement is a movement sometimes um, dubbed as something, you know, imagine it like they're arguing for this idea of like several cultures, you know, would have their like biotope um, and, and would exist, you know, in, in their own places. And so they haven't, don't, they shouldn't be mixed. So it's, to me, it's, it's clearly a, a, a racist, uh, a new form of racism. And um, he's, his book is one of the founding um, things for it. And so um, the next thing um, I was looking at is what does he write, Brent and Tarrant? And there's uh, 13 references to environmentalism in, his, um, in this manifesto. And what are your views, he asks himself. And he says, I'm an ethno-nationalist eco-fascist. Wow. Um, with a focus on the preservation of nature and the natural order. So I'm looking into this. What is eco-fascism? And one guy who's very prominent um, in eco-fascism is Penti Linkola. He's a Finnish, uh, almost 90-year-old uh, man living in the woods. Um, he's a fisherman, and he's coined something called lifeboat ethics. And his idea is that um, when a ship is, uh, when a, you know, a Rettungsboot is filled up to his carrying capacity, um, you have to chop off the hands of those who swim to the ship to um, find rescue. That's his idea of ethics, and he's openly um, supporting terrorist attacks, and he asked for a third world war and the reduction of um, the number of people on this uh, planet um, uh, to one billion at max. And he wants us all to lead a very simple life and not consume anything. And his writing has been a very Finnish phenomenon for decades, but is recently been uh, published in English by the leading publishing house um, in the new right um, English um, uh, environment, Arctos Books, and it actually became one of their best sellers, Can Life Prevail? And they have a, a couple of uh, books that are trying to uh, rediscover and get a hold on environmentalist um, uh, issues um, in, from an ultra-right-wing uh, neo-fascist perspective. And so here, at the core of the manifesto, in the center of the wheel, there's this symbol, the Schwarze Sonne, which is uh, a, a symbol that um, the esoterical uh, current within the Nazi movement, of um, uh, the German Nazi movement of the 30s and 40s, Heinrich Himmler actually built a sort of like a castle-ish retreat with the Schwarze Sonne in the middle. It's composed of um, several uh, swastikas combined, or um, uh, you see flashes. Could you move on, please? Okay, so it's often referred to, you know, Nazi skins like to use it. Could you switch over? Here's the, uh, a bigger photo of where it is in the castle. And that, there's a wonderful film by um, a Cologne-based uh, researcher called Rüdiger Sünne. And uh, Rüdiger Sünne had um, made a movie and a book, which you can buy outside, about um, how the anti-industrialization movement of the 1890s actually um, was absorbed by the fascist Nazi movement. So um, this is a clear reference to um, a, a, a previous part of our history, often overlooked part of our history, where, um, where the Nazis used this um, environmentalist and spiritual movement to, uh, to, uh, as, a, as an add-on in their cocktail of populist movements, they sort of combined to create their power. And it's a stark warning sign to the potentials that um, are the ultra-right see in this um, thing. So here are elements of the excellent film Rudi Gassune uh, made about this. This is some of the early um, 
uh, Rudolf Steiner, environment, theosophical um, thinking. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, a dark part of the environmentalist, um, spiritualist uh, movement. So you see um, current movements referring in their like Wandervögel style to this. Then again, in the manifesto, there's this, um, there's this mentioning of green nationalism. It's the only true nationalism. So that is what Brenton Tarrant is aspiring to. And so I'm, I'm looking up green nationalism, and I'm coming across um, some guy named uh, Paul Kingsnorth, who's a very, very well-known um, former British environmental activist of the 90s who wrote this book, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist. And, um, but he also authored an essay published in The Guardian, where in 2017, after the election of Trump and after Brexit, he argues that coming from an environmentalist uh, perspective, um, he always held the view that um, actually small is beautiful, and you see where this is going, and that it's also, uh, his whole activism was actually about finding his roots and, and the connection to the land that he, and the culture that he grew up in. And so he's asking at the very end of this essay for what might a benevolent green nationalism sound like. So here's somebody who's been an activist in you know, preventing uh, environmentally damaging projects, moving from, from this field into um, supporting Brexit, supporting Donald Trump, and asking for a new formulation of green nationalism because he thinks everything that the um, anti-globalization movement once asked for is now be actually being said by a very different messenger than expected, the, na the new nationalists. And in this is a dark ecology, which some of you might have read. Um, he's actually talking about how he s starts to re-appreciate somebody who's been one of the first eco-terrorists um, so this is um, the Yuna bomber, Ted Kaczynski, and another guy who <laughs> released the manifesto. And he's had kind of a resurgence online, if you look it up, um, because he was in a very popular Netflix documentary. And in his manifesto, um, Ted Kaczynski talks openly, uh, criticizes openly many, many, many times how the left-wing progressives are actually destroying nature. And so he's, he's enjoyed a reappreciation by um, some ultra-right um, people online. And you see all these, this is uh, Fox News on Trump. And so, back please. Um, so one of the uh, reports I was looking at was saying like, the New Zealand terrorist manifesto influenced by far-right online ecosystem. So is that sort of a network I was starting to wonder. So I was looking up Twitter. And there's a movement called the Pine Tree Movement. Um, make ecology deep again, okay? You see that? And um, if, you, if you look into uh, these Pine Tree people, they are not actually, you know, these are not very big accounts. Um, this is one of the bigger ones. But they're there, they're connecting, and they're constantly referring to uh, uh, anti-Semitic ideas, um, ideas of, of deep ecology, where... Um, there's no respect for humanism at all. And here's a, a, another Pine Tree um, a member tweeting about America's voting for the Una bomber. And here she's smiling about a man bleeds to death after being gored in the thigh by a rampaging bull in one of these bullfights in Alicante. So um, that's the sort of spirit. And then there's like uh, big quotations um, of Pentilinkala. So there are things coming together here. Next slide, please. They are publishing eco-fascist reading guides, okay? Um, th there's a whole body of work out there. And I was wondering, who are those people? Mike Cernovich, for example, is one of America's foremost Trump, pro-Trump um, social media personalities. Countercurrence is one of the connecting dots of the right-wing uh, Twitter um, part, but strangely, extinction symbols pops up. France H. Pervert, again, another strange author who's dreaming of a world where we are starting to fight like knights again, and where we are strong bodybuilders. And here you see a deep green thought in this pentilinkula idea that man is not on top of the 
um, uh, of the whole uh, ecosystem, but he's just a simple part equal to any other um, element of it. And I'm finding this on Instagram again. And these are small accounts, but still, they're bringing in paganist elements, just like in the 1890s and the coming decades, um, where the Nazis combined um, Nordic runes and, and uh, uh, spiritual Eastern uh, concepts they had learned about. So, and it's all uh, repeatedly referring to the idea of a near-term societal collapse. So I got really scared. Was this whole form of, many of the speakers have mentioned it today, was this like resurgence of the white supremacist thing, this, this strange white genocide movement, le grand remplacement, was it a, a form of expression of a fatalist perspective on we have failed to avoid catastrophic climate change and we have to prepare for war and for chopping off the hands at the board. So and I reached out to uh, two data researchers and the first data researcher uh, was Danica Proshovsky. Can you um, just not start the video but put it on? Here's a word. Um, Jacob is here because Julia Ebner and his colleague Chloe Colliver couldn't come. Um, he's great, but I first reached out to Julia, your colleague, who I know, to Chloe, and um, also Jim Bendel was speaking to us. I first reached out to a female founding member of um, Extinction Rebellion, and um, we've, we were talking to Donna Haraway to come here um, to this conference, so there was a lot of um, great experts, female great experts, that we would have loved to invite, but it just turned out that Danica is the only female, and I'm sorry for that. And please, let's start um, the presentation. So, hey, Danica, how's it going? It's going well, how are you? Pleasure to have you here. Thanks for helping us. So, um, I called out to you when I was having a serious problem. I saw all these things happening online, and I was wondering, oh, wow, is this like a connected movement? Is it, is it really big? Is it dangerous? Um, and so um, I reached out to the Network Contagion Research Institute that you're a part of. What, what that, does the NCRI do? Well, we map networks of hateful ideologies in online communities and try to understand how they form, what they're doing exactly, and what their motivations are behind their behavior offline and online. Well, how, how, can, you, how can you do this? We use machine learning programs or algorithms, and we have basically scraped the data off of these communities, which means we have all their comments, all their pictures, everything, and, and we store it every day in a database that's unique. So like, for example, the communities that we have data on are 8chan, Poll, which is on 4chan, and Gab. These communities are what we call fringe communities, and they are more extremist communities. They're sort of like Twitter, but they're all banned from Twitter. So they go to these places to talk about their ideas and share and grow together. Oh, so wasn't it, wasn't it H and this is like this bulletin board, um, like a blackboard that the El, El Paso shooter was using and the Christchurch uh, shooter um, to publish their manifestos and and to talk to their thoughts, right? So this is like a, an extremist hangout. It's like a, a bar where only like radicals go, right? Isn't it? Correct. That's their community. That's their audience. That's who they're talking to and, and showing what they're doing when they commit those acts. So um, after my research um, was like half through, I sent you like, I, I sent you this like huge list of keywords that I found like recurring like, Pine tree, green nationalism, Ted Kaczynski, you know, all these things that I, I, I kept on seeing, like uh, white genocide and all these keywords. And then um, I asked you if they like pop up in the conversations um, in these places. And so I was wondering, what did you find there? What right. did you see? 
So just to explain a little bit more, our tools that we have developed, I can plug in your keywords and search. And what can come up is like a frequency day by day of how frequent they are on and being discussed and used. And also our tools pull up how uh, a list of words that are similar, that will be most likely found in the same sentence, in the same conversation as those keywords being searched. So the keywords that you did send me, there wasn't a, I would, there, it, what I found was basically a low hum of Could you exchange. show this? Yes, I can. So let me share my screen with you, and I'll show you two graphs that were produced from, from two of the words that I searched. One is sharing the screen now. Here we go. Okay. So here is a graph of the term eco-fascism on poll. Okay. Oh, that's Gap this, AI. Uh, this, well, this one, oh, I'm sorry, this is, um, the, the title is wrong here, but you can see here that the term on the side is eco-fascism, and this is on poll. Mm -hmm. And this one is the one on Gab. This second graph is the term evergreen that was searched on Gab. Uh, okay, so evergreen, that was the pine tree um, synonymous right. for the Twitter movement that used to label its name with this little green logo. And so I right. thought it might be a talk, talking point for them. What do you see here? Frequency per day yes. goes up to 200 per okay. day, but that's actually, that's this, not Christmas. No, this is around May. Um, and this was around the that one volcano eruption in Europe, I believe. That okay. that's that surrounds that. So they're talking about you know the climate change and the Earth and and, and such like that. Uh, I, I believe on that day. And then so here is okay. also ecofascism. Um, again, I just wanted to show this. The frequency goes up over time. It's not a lot, but it's a low hum, right? The, the conversation is there, and that's, that's these graphs, and when I searched your words, it does show that. So what do you think, um, after looking at this, what do you think of my, my great um, hypothesis of, of the right wing, the, the rise of the new right wing and xenophobic agenda actually being pushed by climate change anxiety on the right? What do you think of it? So I don't believe that it's the driving force behind it. I do believe, though, these ideas of of white genocide and the motivations to 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 go out and defend oneself. These ideas they reach back into into the ideas of climate change and being concerned about the earth. And I would like to show you a what we call a two hop model of the term white genocide when we search it. And what two hop means is that when we search white genocide, what you will see is a spatial cluster of words and their meaning. The more closer the words are, I guess, let me just go ahead and pull it up. Um, the closer, let's see. Here. Okay, so here is our two hop model. White genocide. Oh, wow. Yes, white genocide is here in the middle. Now, the words that are closer to it are more related to it. They're, they're more likely to, to pop, pop up in conversation in the same sentence, in the comment, in the conversation. And the size of the bubble is the frequency of the, the words used. So wait, 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 just quickly. So this is like looking into the brain of one such community when they discuss the word white genocide, right? Correct. This is like the things they associate with and they talk about as well when they discuss white genocide. That is exactly it. And so I want to show you that right here, here's white genocide. And if you follow one of these little gray lines, right up here is this, uh, this idea of volkism and volkish. And it's very close. Good to volkish. A bit bigger. Yes, here, let me zoom right in. So we have white genocide, which is here. And sorry about everything being on top of one another. We just uh, don't want to compromise 
the integrity of moving things. So here we have Volkish and Volkism, Volkism, and it's close here to tribalism. It's also right there. And these, these are the ideas that it reaches into the concerns about blood and soil and the earth and, you know, the, the, the earthly ideology about being concerned about where we, where, you know, how we are related to this planet and the concerns about it. And if we zoom out a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. You I see, see ethno-nationalism as right. well and ethno-nation. So these are terms that the Christchurch shooter was using. So this right. is like sort of like very close to the core of white genocide. Right. And if we just go, so this is this is all one hop away, right? That's then these these terms are forty percent. We are closely associated um, with white genocide in terms of of cosine similarity. And if we do one more hop, you see fascism, fascism right here. Volkish, there's a, a gray line that goes right to it. So that is just one more hop away in terms of meaning space and. So Volkish, Volkism is like the ecology, right, the earth, and then we have fascism, which is, uh, in my idea, that's another way of eco-fascism. It's, it's, but these words are just more used rather than eco-fascism itself. So that's why we see them pop up in this meaning space. So it's actually that I, 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 so what I understand is I was actually, I didn't speak their language. I didn't use the right keyword. They, they frame it in a, in a, in a, in different words, right? Right. So. Right. It's, it's, and it's finding those keywords because in each community, right, it, it, they have their own dialect. They, they start to form their own language here. And unless you have to figure out what it is those keywords are to find the other words that, that have that meaning and figure out exactly what they're saying. And that, that is the point of our tools and what we do and how we map these networks out. We can, we can try to start decoding how, how they're speaking to one another and what their meanings actually are behind their words. Thank you so much for your help, Danica. Um, Hoping to get in touch uh, soon, and please continue the good work. I'm very much looking forward to reading about your findings in the Washington Post and all these other fancy places where you've published your work. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much all the best. for your work. Goodbye, and good luck to Bye. you. Bye. Thanks. So... Thank you, Danica. Um, she can't join us because she doesn't travel on Shabbat and she doesn't actually turn the lights on and stuff. And so, um, I'm sorry to have mentioned, I asked Chloe, I asked Julia, now you're here, but I'm actually very happy that you came because you've um, been looking at the keywords. So I sent you a list of like around 50 keywords that I found recurring, but you were looking at uh, different stuff. Um, you're at the Institute of um, Strategic Dialogue, which is sort of like a think and do tank, they say, um, for looking at online networks, radicalist, radicalization online happening. And you're a specialist working on uh, white supremacists, right? And white genocide topics. And so when I send you these uh, keywords, did you think I'm crazy? Trying to connect to, there's the microphone behind you, <laughs> where you're like, oh, this is impossible to draw a connection between green and, and white supremacist things um, here. No, I wouldn't necessarily say crazy, but um, sort of through our work, we monitor, we sit. I spend far too much time sitting in 4chan, 8chan, basically looking at some of the most extreme sentiment which people are talking about, I and mean, you do see it, but not a huge amount. I wasn't necessarily convinced that it was the most uh, important or salient issue area. So I heard your criticism when we were talking back then. <laughs> and um, So Danica was looking at uh, Gap, HN, and 4chan Paul. Mm -hmm. That's the data they had. What are you looking at? So I was looking at more mainstream social media. And if we could get slides up. I was looking at more mainstream social media, so this would be blogs, um, a lot of Twitter data, but then also um, from another tool, uh, 
uh, Facebook data as well. Now, the tool we use for this is quite similar to Danica's. It's actually a piece of commercial software. It's more likely to be used by a sales executive trying to track how many people are talking about their new product. But what we can do is also plug in terms to track conversation around um, extremist issues. And what so, we're seeing here, what's that total so, volume? Yeah, this, um, we've been hearing about the uh, climate crisis today. This is what I would probably call uh, the crisis with the extreme right. So this is listening to conversation around great replacement, conversation around white genocide, and conversation around the need for an ethno state. And what you can clearly see here is there's a, a large volume of activity online. Like up but to 100,000 here, right? Yeah. And when we, when we really dig down into this as well, we see that this is steadily increasing. So actually, through um, the concerted efforts of extremist groups to uh, propagandize, to campaign, to spread mm. their um, ideology, their hateful ideology, we can, we can see that this is actually increasing um, slowly but surely. And if we go over to the next slide, this is what we get when we plug in the, that conversation around white genocide, around replacement, and combine that with your key terms as well. So what we look at is people who are talking about white genocide, people who are talking about concerns around ethnic displacement, people who are talking about white supremacy in the context of... Uh, Environmentalist, key terms, environmental... Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we can see that the volume here is actually really, really quite small, wow. particularly on Twitter. Yeah. But nevertheless, steadily increasing time mm. on time, again and again. Mm. But it's like really low. This is like up to 200 at max, and then there's a peak at 100. So it's like, and this is like a global perspective, right? This is so this is very, very little that well, you see. Well, yes. Say. Well, this would be a global perspective around the terms you gave me, so English language discussion. Um, so that, that's not to say, though, that I don't think that these um, issues are really, really salient to to the growth of extreme right ideology. As we've heard from um, all of the speakers today, one of the end results of the climate catastrophe and something which is ongoing and unfolding as we see is um, continued migration. So, and that itself will fuel. So I think that actually it's the idea that the white supremacy comes first. The white supremacy comes from a concern around um, ethnic displacement, free migration. However, I think that it's likely that we will see people increasingly tie that to environmentalism. However, there was something else which I wanted to raise with you as well. When we look at this and when we think about the extreme right and the far right, I mean, these groups don't exist in a vacuum. Um, we've seen across the global north the rise of right populist parties, which provide um, the sucker, the nutrients from which these uh, more extremist communities can grow. And there's sort of something um, contradictory uh, in this space, right? So whilst we see um, some of the more extreme groups and extremist groups uh, engaging in a discussion around environmentalism, in eco-fascism, simultaneously we see these populist groups, and populist politicians, from which some of these more extreme um, constituents gain some of their nutrients and, and gain the power to grow, um, actively engaging in climate change denialism as well. And I actually think that this is probably the bigger concern when we talk about the right moving into the far right. So this is Trump, these, Bolsonaro, these Nigel just Farage. Right. some headlines I pulled out, right? But we do nevertheless see an increasing amount of populists engaging in this. So, so these, these are the numbers for the increase in denialist re rhetoric of the German right-wing AFD, right? Yeah, so this um, data came from some work which uh, uh, we did looking at the recent European parliamentary elections. We wanted to know uh, what the different political parties were talking about, what the state of information flow was like there. Um, so we looked at the public Facebook posts made by political parties throughout Europe. And one of the issue areas we were interested in was um, climate change. And as we clearly see, um, the AFD uh, engages in a sort of skeptic, a skepticist or denialist framing around climate change. And this steadily increased. And this has been increasing year on year. So on the one hand, they're talking more and more about climate change, but they're talking more and more in the context of denying climate change, right? Yes, precisely. Okay. And mm. so you have to think about why this happens, right? Where this is coming from. So 
We did uh, an investigation, or if we just stay back here to some degree, we did um, an investigation looking at uh, why the AFD was engaging in climate change denialism. We found that there were ties uh, through a group called Ike, uh, the European Institute of Climate and Economy, to US donors at the Heartland Institute. So actually donors coming from um, uh, the petroleum trade, from the fossil fuel trade. So the Heartland Institute is like a petroleum and fossil fuel. It's, it's a conservative think tank in the United States, but which is uh, heavily funded by fossil fuel groups. Okay, and so they sent money to European... Yeah, exactly, and it's this sort of soft um, flow of, uh, of money from there which is allowing this sort of denialist propaganda to spread online and spread through right-wing groups and even into far-right groups as well. You also see this with Bolsonaro. So you think um, the European right-wing's climate denialism is actually because they get money for it from the US, or what's the hypothesis? To, to some degree, yeah. I also think it's a reactionary talking point. So if we look to the right, uh -huh. these are posts from the AFT about Greta Thunberg. Um, <clears throat> often really quite egregiously mocking her um, for being young, for being a woman, uh, for having autism. And this then becomes a straw man with which you can attack climate change and attack climate change um, activists without engaging in the science at all. I mean, to borrow the alt-right terminology, this becomes about owning the libs, right? This becomes about owning liberals. This comes about the culture war which is growing between the left and the right. It's no longer based in fact, it's based in feeling. And this is something which we've continually seen. We've seen extremist narratives, basically, uh, the extremist battlefield, if you like, become one of narrative wars, become um, one, of, one of values, but one which is increasingly detached from reality. It's more about creating a combative stance between left and right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we go on to this side, and I think this is actually the data which I'm most concerned about, this is conversation around climate change denialism. Wow. This is conversation saying that climate change is a hoax, Climate change is a lie. Climate change is a scam. Climate change is is out there to rob people, and we can see that this is steadily increasing, and this is in huge volumes as well. So, you know, it would would have been so easy in a way. I don't I don't really understand because like some of the core themes of the xenophobic right are like the fear of immigration. So it would have been so easy to seize the opportunity of you know using climate refugees as their like you know main driver that would even have the UN sort of backing the data for the influx of 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 potential migrants so wh why are they not seizing that opportunity here what do you think is the rationale behind I'm, that i'm i'm not uh, i don't have sort of that privileged access inside their minds my <clears throat> assumption would be that it's probably going to come. It's mm -hmm. probably going to continue to come. Uh, migration to Europe has been framed uh, largely in its relation to the Syrian war currently. That's what a lot of people think right. about when they talk about it. And so actually a lot of uh, extremist reaction, uh, the extremist reaction to European migration um, focused on uh, the threat of Islamist infiltration, the threat of sort of cultural incompatibility. I think it's highly likely that they will start to seize upon these issues as well. If you think about um, what gives extremist arguments their power um, is their ability to conjure up a crisis, the ability to um, create a worldview where catastrophe is happening. And they seize upon that, and they seize upon that to inspire extreme action. They seize upon that to inspire terrorist attacks. Now, we've heard today there's a huge amount of concern around this climate crisis, and I think it's inevitable that uh, extremist groups will start to seize upon that as one of their drivers. That's sort of a, a nightmare I'm still having. Thank you for your very quick presentation. We have to rush because we'll have the session. Um, and, you know, given all the data research, then again, during the El Paso shooting, again, the shooter releases a manifesto and he mentions uh, sustainability and environmental limits um, uh, as part of his weird reasoning. But it's kind of a strange reference. I find to um, Brent and Tarrant, you wouldn't agree on that? No, um, I mean, I 
caution around taking these documents too much at face value. I see, yeah. They're quite um, complex beasts. Uh, the Tarrant uh, Manifesto, if you want to call that, contained a lot of sort of cues to try and trip up the media, mm. to try and troll the media. Um, I think the environmental concern within there is, is, is potentially one of the motivating factors, but I think it's secondary. I think environmentalism to these people comes secondary to a white supremacist worldview. So, thank you so much. You look at horrible data in your work, and um, I, my work is um, partly meeting um, horrible people and um, partly having to visit and to discuss with people whom I strongly disagree. And I've, I have to admit, I've um, always had a certain pleasure in at least exploring the other person's mind. So I keep a, a way of, of staying like neutral in a conversation with somebody that I um, would totally disagree and, uh, with. And um, I meet some of, some of the uh, weirdest thinkers sometimes. And so after I got the feedback from you that this is not a big thing, I actually continued like, researching this entire little world of um, uh, green right-wing radicals. And I ended up finding somebody who lives 30 minutes away from me. And I was shocked because I found videos of that person um, stockpiling um, weapons and I decided to visit him and this is what we'll do right now so we've not put him on stage we have not paid for him to come here and I don't regard him as part of the community but um, he's still around to talk to us and this is a reportage not a conference we're visiting him now so on stage now on Skype not on stage now but on Skype this is Piero San Giorgio. Can you put him up? Hello? Hello, Piero. Can you hear me? Thank you for joining us. Hey. So, um, I guess, um, are you in your um, uh, autonomous survivalist base, BAD, right now? I'm just back from it. Geneva, Switzerland now. Okay. So thank you for taking your time. This will be very quick, I guess. Um, so um, I just um, introduce you. You are a French language survivalist based in um, the Geneva area um, who's um, published a couple of books on survivalism after the um, near-term societal collapse that you're seeing, right? Yes. How many books did you sell in total? Like, How many are there out there? I have uh, four books out, mm -hmm. uh, translated into nine languages, and so far I am told I've sold uh, 200,000 copies. That's quite a thing. You have like around 50,000 followers on YouTube-ish, right? And Facebook, sort of. That's your. That's kind of like. And yeah, tell me a little bit about your past, because uh, you had a very different lifestyle in your past. You were a person working in the IT industry, and I found a video of you with a Ramones T-shirt, right? And yeah. when I visited you, we had the REM CD in the car, right? Um, yeah. In your garden. Um, what was the Piero, the old Piero Falotti, the Piero before Piero San Giorgio? Well, uh, it was the, in a way the same person, and I'm a very normal uh, guy of the late uh, part of the 20th century. Um, I used to be in, indeed uh, an executive in, um, in the software industry, and I was specialized in opening new markets for American software companies. Uh, so I know very well Africa, I know very well the Middle East, I know very well Eastern Europe, Russia, and, uh, and of course Europe. And um, I've also been an entrepreneur. I had my own uh, software service company, which I sold, and which is why I have the means to, 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 to pursue now my, uh, uh, my research, my writing, and uh, in a way my passion, which is to, to teach people or, and share my ideas. And um, as you know, uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm not recluse. I like um, music, cinema. I, I, you know, I, I like the modern world until the point I, I found out, or at least I thought, um, in, my, in my research that uh, today's world is not sustainable and therefore uh, yes we can still enjoy and, and, and there's a lot of great things we should uh, save and, and keep from, from our world 
but we have to prepare for the possible worlds of tomorrow and uh, and of course we have to learn from everyone from every culture that exists in the world uh, and indeed i mentioned africa so i know very well how it, how it works in uh, let's say poorer countries uh, the advantages and disadvantages and i hope i bring um, uh, some sort of balance in what i write and what i try to explain to people so um just let me Go back, thanks, Joel, uh, Piero. Um, let me go back here. We have a, a former um, Iraq war, uh, we have a veteran here. Um, as a soldier, you were actually protesting against the war in Iraq back then in, in Geneva, you told me. I certainly was in 2002 and 2003. And, there was uh, a, and, I, mm -hmm. and I am still against um, imperialism and war on the principle that um, every people, every nation should manage its own territory and its own people without going in, in this case in Iraq. For me at the time, it was very eye-opening that the powerful country like the United States, uh, at least the elites, were willing to go to war. And I, and I know what war is, probably not as much as this gentleman. And I believe I, I've read one of your books, sir. Um, and. Uh, Uh, But it was, me, clear, it was for resources mostly. It was to control uh, resources or deny these resources to other players in the global uh, imperialist reach for, for especially oil in this case. So you, you were, you were I, I saw when I was visiting you, I saw all these books like Six Degrees Fahrenheit that you read. Um, there are all these like, well, back then you told me you were a um, Green Party voter, right? And you have all these like env environmental references on your um, website. What is the role of climate change in the coming uh, societal collapse that you envision? It's like the first chapter in your book. Yes, it's in the first part. So, so for me, environment is obviously, it's obvious, it's so important for sustaining the ecological niches and systems that allows us humans uh, to survive, right, to live. And um, for me, the, the most uh, important element was the pollution. And I've seen in Africa, I've seen in Russia, the, disa the disasters that have happened. And so obviously I'm very sensible to, to the ec ecological approach. I was a bit disappointed, I must admit, with the, with the po politicization of ecology, which I still see today in all this thing about climate change which I've been hearing since I'm a child, since the 1970s, I've been hearing first that, you know, the planet was getting cold and now it, they're telling that uh, we're all going to die. And, and um, uh, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not a scientist, so it's very hard for me to check the data. But I'm very, first of all, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical on everything. I'm an atheist. I'm, I'm a little bit of uh, an anarchist in, 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 in this kind of approach. So I am not convinced that the, The current political approach to um, taxing people for uh, for what we don't know, but certainly to to make us scared about this global uh, climate change. I'm not sure this is perfectly honest and accurate. However, so, today, I mean, um, I've seen you on on video with David Icke, who's a conspiracy theorist, talking about like the reptilians actually and the Illuminati and that sort of stuff, who's a total disbeliever in climate change. And I can't bring these things together, but because we have very little time. Sure. Um, I, I, do I you envi how the will the societal collapse look like from your perspective? What will happen? You expect conflict, right? What, what, yes. How will that conflict look like in detail? Yes, so, so let, let me just say very quickly, um, when, when I say that I'm skeptical, I'm not saying that I'm, I don't believe it. And I don't want to believe, I want to know. I want to know exactly the data and things. And it is on every topic. So my, what I write in my books and what, what my theory is, is that we have a convergence of very large problems, one of which is ecological. It's the environment, it's pollution. Maybe it is climate change. But the other element is a huge debt, the financial destruction of our societies, the de disindustrialization of most of the countries, um, the reliance on natural resources, which is becoming, uh, whose are becoming uh, scarce over time. And I think, and of course, the overpopulation of, of the world, the, the more and more people, 
that wants to consume like uh, like like the richest people in the world, like Americans, like Europeans. And so this is this is an equation that is doomed to fail. So if it fails, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe we have a, a miracle, but I'm I don't believe in miracles. If it does fail, we have a difficult situation, and I think everyone. And how you know, will that difficult situation look like? So you envision well, it, gangs fighting each other, right? Just give me an image of of because in your book it's so clearly written down. It's um, there are many hypotheses and 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 results, but certainly humans forever have been fighting over resources when the resources are rare. So you can imagine that there's going to be. Countries, groups of people, uh, criminal gangs, or criminal organizations, some are very large, that will try to control and, 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 and take these resources. At the same time, people will start to be more and more around the world, hungry, displaced, m mass migrations. I predicted the mass migration of the last five or six years uh, many years ago. I'm not the only one, but it was obvious that this would happen. And this will eventually lead to big conflicts. And these big conflicts are one of the elements to which we need to prepare. Is this, and, uh, is this why, you, so you got yourself, um, we have uh, another person here who's preparing um, and he's totally, um, he totally doesn't want any arms, but how many weapons do you have approximately in your base autonome durable? I have enough for me and my friends and my family, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, whom do you whom do you expect? Like, who do you think these bullets are for? When would you start shooting? Well, the law says that we we are allowed to shoot to preserve our own life, the life of others, uh, and and different things. It's called self defense. Right. So I'm not I'm not eagerly expecting or waiting. I'm not this crazy guy in the bunker who waits to shoot people. I'm against. I'm, 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 I'm for peace. I'm a peaceful man. However, I'm not non-violent in the sense that eventually there is elements. I'm not um, hypocrite in the sense that I know that violence is what rules the world. Uh, you have police who uses violence to take your taxes. You have uh, violence everywhere. It's just a question of how you manage um, the elements that are violent, if any. If not, Hey, great, we, we stay peaceful. But, but eventually I will have no hesitation to protect my life, to protect the life of my family and the people in my village and even my country. You told, uh, me, you told me that, if I may ask, sorry, we're really running out of time. You told me that you think the multicultural society is the biggest risk um, currently. And um, why? Is that the biggest risk? Because you you said you're sure that the societal collapse will come within the next five or ten years or so, something like that. You said probably next year, probably in ten years. And um, why do you think um, the multicultural society is the biggest risk? I don't know if it's the biggest risk, but it's definitely a risk. In history, it shows that uh, when you have multiple cultures in the same territory, when resources fall down. Usually, multicultural societies become multi-racist and multi-conflictual. It's not something I like. I like people from all over the world, but I must realize that when, I, when I've been traveling in Africa and elsewhere, I have seen conflicts, especially when resources are, are reduced, and especially when there is political manipulation, and we have to expect this. So you course. think this will turn out into a war? I mean, I've seen your video with Vary Vikernes, who's a known neo-Nazi. Um, who's an Vary Vikernes? He's an open neo-Nazi, oh. right? He, uh, and yes. he, so you were you were talking about like how you would have to defend yourself against the immigrants in that situation, right? So would these bullets that you have in your house, in the coming collapse that you expect to happen, would these bullets then be for for the people coming from the south to Switzerland, for example? Well. I that I don't really care if anyone, I don't care of the color of the skin or the provenience of someone who's trying to, to threaten my life. If people come very peacefully, we'll find an arrangement, whether they are Swedish or from Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter to me. I am not, I'm not on that. As for meeting people, you, you must, you know, you, I'm sure you're honest to say that I meet people from all over the world. Like I've met Noam Chomsky just as much as I've met uh, this, this Varad Virkenes. So, uh, you know, don't let your, the audience think that I've, meet, I've met 
uh, David Icke or, or, or this uh, neo-Nazi, and I doubt he's neo-Nazi, by the way. He might have been in the past, but anyway, it doesn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking to everyone. So, I'm talking to you guys, right? So I'm... I'm, so, uh, I'm, 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 I'm I'd, I'd appreciate it that you let me um, talk to you. I, I, I'm, I'm strongly concerned um, and I'm, I'm strongly um, against the idea that the um, multicultural... Um, society is a risk in that situation, and you you know this because I told you so. And uh, I think it's actually an asset um, if we stay together. And I hope very much that it will not come to the conflicts uh, that you're envisioning. Um, yes. And so, this is um, I guess. At what point would you turn your gun against me? Like, what would be the moment? Well, I was getting all, scared. I saw all these guns. I saw you, you had this horrible book um, on your desk, The Turner Diaries, which is yes. like the Ku Klux Klan founding foundational book. You had Umberto Eco in the next corner, I know. But on your actual current table, there was The Turner Diaries. Yes. So when would you turn your weapon against me? For, well, first of all, you see that I'm open-minded. I read all sorts of material. And, uh, and and I'm I'm very open. I have in my house. I read the Cor- I read the Quran. I've read uh, I've read uh, the Communist Manifesto. I mean, it's uh, horrible books, but it's very interesting to to, to read. Um, as for turning my gun on you, well, first of all, unless you're trying to kill me, I will never turn your gun on you. Because why? Why would I? Why why would I? Uh, you're not a threat to me. So why would I do it? Uh, and also, you know. First and also what you said, you know, that you think you think the opposite of me on multiculturalism. First of all, I respect the way you, I respect people who have different opinion. And right. as I said, first chapter in my book is is think by yourselves. I don't want people to copy me or do the same thing because, as I want. Okay. I want people to think independently. Okay. So very last question, time is up. Um, um, do you think because you know the right so well, do you think the right is picking up on climate change currently? I'm not sure. I'm not okay. sure. I think that uh, um, you mean the right, as in the political parties, or well, um, extremist rights. Well, I don't know them very well, so <laughs> you have to ask them. But before you leave, I must show you something. Um, this is what I caught. This is what I'm going to eat tonight, and this is from the garden just now. So, just to let your audience know that my focus is not to shoot people, my focus is there are seven elements, one of which is, for example, okay. having food. And this morning, for example, I got this from the garden and I have okay. blueberries. That's, so <laughs> that's, that's from the garden. So we are for peace and we are for the plants. Thank you so much, Giorgio. Okay. You're welcome. Oh, my God. Um... So, we'll open the uh, panel right now. Please come on stage. David, Benjamin, Roy, thank you so much. Okay. Um. Hi, okay, I'm going to speak English as well. Um, I'm with Extinction Rebellion, um, just to be transparent up front. Um, I did not like, I'm just addressing you for now, because I did not like what you were insinuating in your presentation right now, that we are a right-wing extremist organization, which oh, we no, are... I said the contrary. I said it doesn't have anything to do with the lovely people I met ex- at okay. Extinction Rebellion. I want to yeah. repeat that. It's like I'm, I'm looking at um, uh, potential abuses of environmentalist issues by radical right-wing so people. So you set us as a contrast to actual right-wing movements. Uh, yeah, you are uh, absolutely in contrast to the person okay. which just to clarify, so just, I, <laughs> because, I, I, no, because no. that was unclear from... No, from I'm, where we were sitting, no, and I'm, I was just wanting... The one thing that I'm scared about um, with Extinction Rebellion is the idea of the panic button. I've made that clear. That's something that okay, I'm but, but sort that's, of scared that's about. Another, what that's will another be discussion the, we can... We you're can... not a right-wing movement, okay. clearly not. I've Thank had you. the loveliest treatment with Extinction Rebellion. Thank okay. you for that, to clarify that. So, questions, please, from the audience? Hi there, uh, my name is Katarina. I'm representing the Psychologists for Future. And I have a question, um, I think, especially for Jem. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. I'm not sure you can hear us. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it's been uh, incredibly 
interesting to hear all of you, all of your talks. And my question uh, is, as psychologists, as professionals dealing with people who uh, suffer from climate anxiety, um, what do you think are the most pressing questions or matters that we should address uh, in the upcoming months? Thank you. Shall I start speaking? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you for the question. Well, that's a huge question. Uh, we have live debates about it in the Deep Adaptation Forum in the uh, uh, coaching and counselling group and on the Positive Deep Adaptation Facebook group. Uh, I, I hear from the UK psychotherapeutic world that this is the big new thing that's presenting uh, where people are coming with all kinds of environmental anxiety, and despair and trauma. And of course it relates how people sit with this terrible information also relates to whatever, however they're experiencing life and their mental health in general. It, the best, the most important things to do, um, uh, I, I'm new to this. I'm not a, I've, I've, I'm not a therapist. I don't know much about it. Uh, but I'm listening to people who are really involved, like the Climate Psychology Alliance, and they're really clear that we shouldn't pathologize what is a natural reaction, and we shouldn't just look at things like uh, the, the typical things about, well, get out more and uh, switch off your internet and uh, do things you like and all the kind of tips and stuff, when actually this is, uh, this is an existential challenge. It's, an, it's a challenge to the core of our identity, and perhaps there's no way out of this. There's no way of finding some kind of calm without allowing yourself to look really deep inside about, well, how do you experience life? What's the meaning of your life? Um, uh, in, a, in a way, therefore, that cl this climate crisis is a spiritual invitation. And I don't quite know how a secular psychotherapeutic field uh, will relate to that, but I think it, it has to be open, much more open, to the transcendental and the spiritual realms uh, as a way, if, 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 if clients who are in despair are open to that. So um, I'm, I'm certainly going to be looking a bit more at that one because I'm going to give a speech to the UK uh, psychotherapeutic uh, profession in, in October on this. Thank you, Chan. Hello. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Alois. I want to mention one topic which I missed a little bit during the three hours. That is uh, uh, religion. Um, um, the, what I'm thinking about is uh, that there are, especially the, the, the conservative religious people saying that uh, it's God's will and whatever we do, it doesn't matter because it's God's will. Uh, what what do you think about this? Uh, the role of religion in the, combating climate change, or yes, okay. So um, <laughs> my eyes fall on you, Roy. Also on David. Roy, do you want to give it a start? Um, it's the role of of religion in combating climate change. Um, uh, I teach at a Catholic university. Um, and there's, uh, I'm not Catholic myself. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the Pope has come out with Laudato Si and, and certain statements about uh, the necessity for taking more seriously ideas of stewardship and, um, uh, and thinking more deeply and more actively about our collective life uh, on this planet. Uh, there's certainly ways that, um, various religious traditions can be brought into the question of our relation to the earth, uh, the, the environment that we live in, um, and uh, how we address and process this, this transformation. So on the one hand, there is, there's something like Laudato Si and, and these things that the, that the Pope have put out, but there's also, there's another, there's another aspect of people on campus, and, uh, and 
I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm particularly targeting Catholics. This is just what I know about. There's a, a, um, a political theorist, Patrick Deneen, who is associated with some people who um, identify as, as integral, integralists who believe that the Catholic Church should essentially uh, take over the U.S. government and uh, institute a new kind of, uh, a, a new theocratic regime. Uh, Patrick Deneen talks, uh, quotes Wendell Berry in his book. He's not exactly an integralist. He's not exactly one of these people who are, um, go for the, the Benedict option, which is to say that uh, there are other people who believe that we should group up and sort of retreat from the world and focus on our, our own. These, these would be Catholic values, or Christian values. My point in bringing up these different aspects is to say that as with any other very broad um, tradition, very old tradition, right? There's gonna be different camps within any group. And, and I've seen this in my experience with Catholicism at Notre Dame, there are different people approach the question of climate change in different ways. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know whether that's a very satisfying answer. Uh, it, seems, it seems deeply complex. Have you, have you come across something religion related in your research anything of interest here? Well, I think any time you're talking about, you know, humans' relation to the natural world, um, religious language courses through that conversation. It's it's hard to avoid. And, um, you know, I would say it's, it's one of the clearest descriptions of the way that humanity has behaved, especially in the West, with regard to the natural environment, is the word dominion, which is lifted from um, religious tradition. I wouldn't say that I think that that tradition has caused our bad behavior to the environment, but um, it's sort of, you know, as, as a few people have mentioned, whenever you're, whenever you're thinking um, and talking through this subject, it's hard to avoid religious and existential questions. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to turn to existing religious or philosophical existential um, traditions to answer it, but probably how we do respond will be will also have the contours of that kind of um, will be shaped response. by people's religious. Perspective. Well, that too. But I, what I mean is that it will look on on some level like a like a religious or a philosophical response because it will be um, a kind of you know because it will um, it will be a response at that level of, you know engaged in these big questions. Um, I just wanted to say one thing to the first question, actually, since um, to jump onto Jem's point. I mean, I would say, you know, I'm not um, I'm not a religious person, and I um, I'm also not somebody who's spent any time in therapy or anything. But um, from my perspective, and I, I may be speaking from my own my own experience, but in, in my experience, the best antidote to despair about climate change has been engagement and action and some um, hope for progress. Um, I think the best thing that we can do collectively to avoid the planet falling into widespread despair is to try to limit the amount of damage that's done. Um, and I find, you know, personally, not to say that my writing in my book has been all that important, but simply having a project which seems in some way productive to me, um, in which I can channel my own anxieties and fears, has been at a very, just at a very personal level, useful and therapeutic. And I imagine that um, the protest movements like XR, but not exclusively XR, that have sprung up over the last year have had similarly therapeutic value to the people who are engaging in them, in addition to whatever <laughs> political value they've, um, they've offered. Thank you. So there's a question in the back. Um, yes. Um, thank you very much for this uh, series of interviews, especially the last one, I think, uh, showed us very well that not every ecology is the same with every ecology. That we have really, since we start to think ecologically, we have to really um, decide or try to discuss about what kind of ecology we want to do and think about. Because as we see, there's also the right wing which says our ecology is the whites should survive. And since there is the panic button uh, question, which I think is the urgency, the question is what do we want? What, what can we do now, right? And how do we solve this situation? What do we demand also at the moment? And my question, and what I was missing, if you want, is that we don't, uh, there's a blind spot in who is the we in all that stuff. Uh, because um, if we, we talked about the Anthropocene, 
But what is a clear uh, question in the ecological discourse is which anthropos are we talking about? It's not all humanity who caused the ecological climate. It's a humanity that is based on the white male northern western thought and kind of life and uh, that is why the ecological discourse is very much articulated by decolonial thinkers is very much articulated from the global south and is very much articulated by feminist thinkers and female thinkers because as we know especially and we said it the people who who suffer the most in the climate uh, crisis at the moment are the people from the global south. They are the ones that uh, did not produce this lifestyle that we are living. Uh, uh, they are the ones that actually had a, have a balance, a way of thinking nature and humanity and the Anthropocene in a complete other way. And actually feminist thinkers and decolonial thinkers draw to them to answer the questions what do we thank you? Yes, and it is also spiritual if okay. you want. So. Draw to them to answer the question, how do we, are we going to organize to live differently? Because this is what it is. So my question is, yeah? So my question is, how are we going to live differently? And my question is to you, to what extent do you um, uh, draw your inspiration for the ecological thinking from decolonial thinkers and from feminist thinkers. I mean, Octavia Butler was writing in the 90s what you uh, are writing. Thank yes, you. and so thank to what for... extent, to what extent do you draw your arguments from decolonial thinkers and feminist thinkers? And last, um, do you think that we can change something by pers private consuming? Because this is what we get out of okay. the conclusion. So we'll make the answer quick. Thank you for pointing yeah. out. I can. <laughs> Thank you for pointing out the valuable um, contributions in this field by thinkers from the south and uh, feminist thinkers. And it's actually, it's actually also been, it's been actually my mom who raised me with the Club of Rome stuff. So that I actually, this is why it's a lifelong thing. Thanks, mom. It's um, and so. Um, could I? Yeah, Roy. So, uh, so I, thanks for that, that point. I mean, I, I teach Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin. I cite James Baldwin and others in my, in my book. Um, and uh, my thinking on this, the, the philosophical problems that, the, that climate change poses emerges uh, out of work that Dipesh Chakrabarty uh, at the University of Chicago, a great post-colonial theorist, uh, has been doing. Um, and so that's, that's all key. Uh, and I've also been in dialogue the last couple of years with Amitav Ghosh, the novelist. And in, in a panel, um, I was on with him uh, not too long ago, uh, a similar, some, some version of this question came up and his, his, he, he responded by saying, well, it doesn't matter what the United States does. It doesn't matter what Europe does. China and India will decide the future of this planet. And so in a certain way, we're already beyond the question of whether the Anthropos is a white man, right? We're, we're looking at a global situation, right? And, and a global problem being driven by, by multiple countries, right? Um, it's, it's, it's satisfying in a certain way to, to bring it down to, the, to a historical situation and to sort of, in, in a certain way, re reverse, right, the privilege of, of Western modern capitalist countries by then taking on that blame, like by saying it's our fault, right? It's the West's fault, it's Britain's fault, and there's a certain logic to that. But the question of blame is, isn't even the operative question anymore. The question is what do we do? about what do we individually do and how do we build a better we, right, in this situation. Uh, because it's not just, the Anthropos isn't, uh, it isn't the people in this room, it isn't primarily male, it isn't primarily white, right? The, the, the greatest suffering that's going to emerge from catastrophic ecological collapse and global climate change is not going to be the people in industrialized nations in the north, right? That greatest suffering is going to come to people in 
uh, what we're called developing nations or you know, in the global south, it's gonna come to women and children all over the world as, as, as states collapse, as food becomes scarce, as uh, you know, uh, extremist and, and fundamentalist groups emerge to take power when civil society collapses. Right. So that's, that's the situation. You know, we're already, we need to, to remember that it is a global situation and we need to remember that there are differential impacts, yes. Um, and then come back again to this question of. We're sort of running out of time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Probably you, you could discuss <laughs> bilaterally because there's like two contributions, I think. And I, I just to have a more positive remark um, also, um, where do you draw your positivity from your hope? David, I wanted to ask you. Everyone's asking me about why is there the, the positive you know, connotation, this like uplifting sort of like you know, trust in we'll somehow not go to the very bitter end. Personally, I think it's really a matter of perspective. And the first important part of my perspective is that, um, as I said a couple of times already, this is not a binary question. It's a matter of where we land on a spectrum of suffering. Um, and so it's not a matter of, you know, losing um, or winning. It's a matter of where on that timeline we end up. And then secondly, it's a matter of, um, from my perspective, basing our expectations not on the climate as it exists today, which, as I said earlier, is already hotter than it's ever been in all of human history, but is certainly going to get hotter still. But um, basing those expectations for the future on the path we're on and where we're headed. And if your set of expectations are that, you know, by the end of the century, we'll be at four degrees, I think that there's quite a lot of reason to think that we'll um, change course and avoid that level of warming. Um, we may not, but I think that there's good reason to believe that it's certainly possible. And because I also don't believe that this is a binary question, I do feel very strongly that if we are able to take action that will allow us to land at you know 2.5 or 2.7 degrees instead of 3.8 or 4.2 degrees, that will be enormously valuable in terms of how much suffering we're avoiding. Um, but if we're hoping to preserve the planet's climate at 1.1 degrees or at zero degrees of warming, I do think that there's no cause for optimism there at all. I think that's a totally lost cause. Oh, um, thank you. Did that cheer you up? Um, this amazing question about, uh, some people hear that question of, in, they think as if it's blaming and shaming. So, so, so what, is, uh, what is at fault and therefore who's to blame? But actually uh, the question about, if you want to focus on what do we need to do now, then we need to know why we have got into this predicament. If we just see this as somehow some unfortunate accident, uh, then we're not really looking at how we have destroyed the, the planet um, and at least destroyed it for our own habitation. And so there's deep questions to ask about how we've got into this situation. And absolutely, patriarchy is at the heart of the, the reason we're in, in this problem. It goes deeper than capitalism. It's in patriarchy. And, and the problem is, is that... Um, I'm only really beginning to learn what that means. You know, I thought that was to do with men. It's actually women who constitute patriarchy too. It's the, and it's, it's, it's simple things. Like uh, if we hear someone who's upset, we think that we need to fix it. Um, or that we think that if we were a bit worried and if we've got some emotional pain, that we need a, an intellectual story to fix it. It's, there, are, there are ways of thinking and being in this world uh, which are part of patriarchy and which really are not helpful for how we... Uh, need to come together now at this time. Um, so, yeah, we do need to look at that. That's, that's part of asking the question of what to do, is to look at what's gone wrong. Thank um, you. And absolutely, uh, the oppression of, of women and the divine, the, the feminine div aspect of the divine for thousands of years is part of the whole project. The enlightenment, so-called, uh, uh, the, 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 the supremacy of rational uh, thinking, all these things are, are involved in this because Thank you. there's nothing rational about the situation we've got ourselves into. Jem, we're a bit running out of time, we're like over okay. time. Okay. Thank you so much um, for this. There was a gentleman, I okay, think he had a I, question. I, I still want to discuss this point, uh, pu pushing the alarm button, or you, you call it making panic. And then uh, what would you... Uh, it's all, all of you. 
I mean, if, if you say, not now pushing the alarm button at the most, what else can we do? Then, then we say, okay, the people will panic when the next major disruption will come, and it will come. We agree about that, that it will come. So if you don't push the panic button now, what shall we do then? Just preparing ourselves personally? I can't agree with that, and I can't see this idea. So my idea still is, why don't raise up the, the, the scientists, the, the cultural people, the, the leading religious people for a hunger strike in the world? Maybe it starts somewhere, maybe it starts even in Germany, but some kind of thing that has a real impact, that, that makes clear this is for the, it, everyone is concerned. If, if, if something would happen of that scale that would be natural, everyone would see it. The Russians, the, the US, the, the, the Chinese would stay together. Okay. Oh, we have to do it together, but we have to, to to realize such an impact by our ourselves now. That okay. would be my idea. Thank you for your uh, contribution. And um, here's the last, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, uh, funny thing, it's about uh, the same thing. It's about pushing the alarming button. I'm from Extinction Rebellion as well, just to be clear. And I want to give another thought into the debate. And that is, if we don't push the button maybe then the extremists, the right-wing extremists, will push the button by themselves, and then more and more people are going to them instead of us who are trying to hold everything together. All right. Um, I think that's it. We've, we've done a long journey. Um, and <laughs> OK, Jem. Leaving you the last word here, a general hunger strike as the ultimate alarm button to be pushed. Yeah, so um, uh, why not? Basically, if, if we respond to this crisis with a desire to uh, reduce harm rather than just to buy ourselves a few more years or a bit better quality of life ourselves for our family for a bit longer, if we actually want to do more than that, then this is a political moment. And if we don't engage in it and try and uh, basically achieve political power at the top and in local government and everywhere, then absolutely, as soon as the hard right decide to use climate for their own ends, they will. So I'm, I'm with the last uh, questioner. Uh, I just want to say on the, uh, I wanted to come back to one question. Uh, when people say uh, this is God's will, it can also come with a sort of a, oh, well, let's just be fatalist. If it is God's will, then what does God will us to learn or unlearn? That's a, uh, that's a that's, one of the that old would be questions. How I would, that's <laughs> how I would ask anyone who wants to, to cite God in order to sort of step away from this rather than in, fully engage in it. Thank you for um, participating in the conversation yes. and taking your time, Jam. Okay, bye-bye. Well, um, I want to thank um, the speakers. Um, I want to thank um, Benjamin, who is going to travel back to his um, secret farm. You can follow him on the, at the Pirate Ben on Instagram. It's some sort of Instagram activism. And um, you should um, give David Wallace Wells' book a sincere try, because it's a wonderfully eloquent quick march through, it's kind of the update you want to read, and um, equally challenging but touching on a very different note is uh, the literature and also the other books that Royce Granton is writing as a literary writer as well. So uh, look at this uh, prolific um, writer and follow or have a look at what the ISD is doing Thank you, Jacob. Please say hi to Chloe. <laughs> and it's been a, a hell of a ride. Thanks for coming with us on this trip. I'm not used to moderate these last final panels, but I enjoyed that you stayed here with us for all of this. Thank you, Lena, for organizing it. Thank you, Merle, for helping here. Thank you so much, James Ferraro, for your concert. And now we're starting with a last track and you're ready to stay, you're ready to go, whatever you pick. I will be staying here listening and goodbye.